You know, there's a story about a guy who um, began having some weird uh, symptoms in his body. He was going through a period where he was having trouble breathing quite often, and, and, and he, would, he would have dizzy spells kind of, you know, on a regular basis, and, and, and furthermore, he felt a lot of pressure behind his eyes in his head, and sometimes he literally felt like his eyes were going to bug out or something, and the symptoms weren't going away, so he <clears throat> finally went to the doctor to check on this, and the doctor, you know, just, you know, just examined him very thoroughly and everything, and, and finally the doctor had to meet, you know, I'm not exactly sure what this is, but I can tell you these symptoms are serious, and if these persist, you, uh, you're talking about a, a year to live. Oh, can't believe it. So he thought, I got a year to live. He went, quit his job, got his bucket list out, you know, took all his money out of the bank, decided, I might as well enjoy the year. He went on a world tour, did all the things he'd kind of wanted to do and wished he could do and places he wanted to see and, and just went out and just enjoyed the year to the max every way he could possibly think of to do that. And finally, it's getting near the end of the year. Symptoms haven't gone away at all. And, and he finally decides, well, I know I haven't got long now, so he didn't have much money left. He pretty much spent it all, and he thought, I'm going to take the rest of the money I, I have left, and I'm going to buy the best suit I can find to be buried in. Might as well get the best. So he went to a tailor, you know, and he's getting outfitted for just this, you know, this wonderful suit. And the tailor, you know, is checking him out, you know, and measuring him. And he said, by the way, what, what size neck do you wear? And he said, I wear a 15. And the tailor, you know, looked at me and said, you know, actually, you're a 15 and a half. Oh, no, no. I've always been a 15. I wear a 15 size neck. And the tailor said, no, no, you're a 15 and a half. And let me tell you right now, if you wear a 15, you're going to find yourself having trouble breathing, having dizzy spells, pressure behind your eyes. You'll feel sometimes like your eyes are bugging out. <laughs> Misinterpretation, wrong thinking can really mess things up, you know? But, you know, I say that to say this, that we live in a world that throughout its history has been characterized by wrong thinking. I mean, you study history. You know, George Washington, they felt at his time when he got sick, the best thing to do would be to bleed the bad blood out of him, huh? So they would bleed him, and he wasn't getting better, so they would bleed him some more. Get that bad blood out of there. Bleed him some more. We cringe at that. He, they, they ultimately killed him that way. But you know, it's not just back then. It's sort of, a, so, so, sort of indicative of man's thinking in our history over the years. Remember when eggs were on the bad list? Don't eat eggs. Eggs will kill you. We've discovered latest scientific fact. Flash, flash. Eggs are not good. Everybody went off eggs. Poor eggs. <laughs> but you know what? A few years later, oh, we discovered eggs are really okay. In fact, they're good. So now we're back on eggs, you know? Back in the 50s, Dr. Spock came out with a book on raising your children. Some of you will remember that. It was a bestseller. It was the latest thing out there. And basically his point was, we've been doing it wrong from time immemorial. Do not discipline your children. You're squishing and squashing that tender little ego of theirs. Let it express itself. No wonder there's been problems and people are so messed up. We've been squelching them. Let it go. And so there was a whole generation that just bought into that. I think we've been experiencing the consequences of that. <laughs> I understand that Dr. Spock on his deathbed, now that's just hearsay, I don't know this for sure, but I'd heard that he had actually recanted on his deathbed. We blow it. I remember one day, one evening, you know how on the, on the TV once in a while they'll have this little news flash, you know, and, and they'll say, more at 11, you know, a little something, more at 11. I'll never forget this. This lady very seriously comes on there. Celibacy may cause cancer. More at 11. <laughs> Give me a break. <clears throat> and so, brethren, it's, what's interesting is how quickly people are willing to jump on the most current bandwagon and think it's just the greatest thing since sliced bread. And then another one comes along and they jump on that one. 
So there was a time when, man, if you were current, you wouldn't eat eggs. And then a little while later, if you were current, eat eggs. If you were current, don't drink coffee. It'll kill you. Now you're hearing more and more about the health benefits of coffee. I don't mind that one so much. But you know, you see that kind of stuff. But here's where it really gets tragic. I mean, you would think we would finally catch on and going, what's going on here? Man's thinking can really be warped sometimes. And he doesn't know what he's talking about a lot of the time. But where it really gets tragic is when the world tries to dictate how we should think or what we should believe when it comes into the realm of morality or ethics or spiritually. You know what Isaiah said in chapter 5, verse 20? He said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to them. And that's exactly what we're seeing happening in our own culture, in our own society. We're living at a time where the Bible is systematically being removed from the public eye as much as possible, and at the same time, pornography is being protected by the First Amendment. We're living at a time where the proper thing to do is to bless Islam and that that religious system and open your doors to it and curse Israel, God's chosen people. At the same time, we're living in an era when a teacher can have on his or her desk a copy of Karl Marx's, you know, Communist Manifesto, or for that matter, even a Quran, and that's progressive and that's open-minded, but she can have or he can have a Bible on their desk. What's wrong with that picture? We're living in an era now where we're being told that abstinence before marriage is weird, and it's probably a mistake. Living together before you get married is really the smart thing to do. And Isaiah said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. No wonder this world is in such a mess. Kind of reminds me of another story. Motorcyclist is going down the road on an autumn day, kind of cool, and it's a lonely two-lane road, you know, just out there in the country, And there's a guy thumbing along the side of the road. And he knows not very many cars are coming down this road. And the motorcyclist said, well, I could put him on the back of my motorcycle. So he pulls over and he said, you know, I'd be happy to give you a lift. You don't mind riding on the back of my motorcycle? And the guy said, hey, listen, I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank you. So the motorcyclist saw the guy, you know, and he had a little coat on. and, And he said, you know something, it's pretty cool this morning. You know what I'd recommend? Why don't you turn your coat around, wear it the other way, and we'll zip it up and everything, and you'll feel warmer. I said, oh, good, thank you. And so they turned his coat around and zipped it up and stuck him on the back of the motorcycle, and he's tooling down the road. He's not thinking about it. He's tooling along, and, you know, a little while later, he's wondering, gee, I wonder how that guy's doing back there. You know, they hadn't communicated or anything, and he sort of glanced back. He's not there. Oh, no. He whips around, goes back about a half a mile back on the road. There's the guy laying in the road, spread eagle, and and there's a local farmer kind of over the guy. And so he comes up on his motorcycle, very concerned. He said, is he okay? The farmer looks at him and says, well, he, he was right at first, but then when I turned his head around the back way, the right way, he hasn't been too good since then. a joke (laughs) yo we live though in a crazy mixed up twisted world and brethren it's in the it's in this world that our lord says to us look what he says in verse 2 do not be conformed to this world you could put that you could translate that stop being conformed to this world stop being conformed according to its thinking, its ways, its, its values, which are just molded by this world. But rather, rather than that, he goes on in verse 2, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be transformed, he says. What is he saying? Allow the Holy Spirit the space. Allow the Holy Spirit that place to do a transforming work in your life. And that will involve 
the renewing of your mind. That's the point he's making right here. That renewing of your mind can be uh, carries the idea of a complete renovation. God says, I'm going to go there and I'm going to do a, a complete renovation in there of your mind. You know, some years ago, I knew a guy that was in the Navy and he was actually on shore leave for quite a while because his ship was in dry dock and he said it was going to be in dry dock for about six months or so. Quite a while, they were doing a complete renovation of his ship because the ship was going to be assigned to Antarctica in order they had to do a total renovation of the ship. And he said, when this ship is finished, it'll be the same shell, but it will be a different ship with a different duty. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in us. By the renewing of our mind. Same shell, but a different ship with a different duty. In verses 3 to 8, he talks about, describes what a renewed mind will include. And there's three areas in particular he nails here. One is how we think about ourselves. Secondly, how we think about our fellow man, particularly other brothers and sisters in Christ. And then thirdly, our thinking about our purpose for being here. So notice, regarding renewed thinking about ourselves, look what he says, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, I'm not leaving anybody out here, Christian, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Literally, do not super think about yourself. Don't get all impressed, hyped about you. Don't, fall, don't cop that attitude or get that feeling, <laughs> look at me, I'm pretty good. I'm good. I'm good. You know? Don't be like the woodpecker that goes up to this great big pine tree and you know how woodpeckers go, brr, brr, you know, uh, they, they go fast. Well, this woodpecker goes up this pine tree in the middle of the forest, and the instant that first peck, the, the bee, touched the tree, there was a crack of lightning, hit the top of that tree, knocked the woodpecker back off the tree, and split that tree right down the middle. And the woodpecker on the ground looks up and goes, I didn't know I had it in me. Wow. Brethren, we have a tendency, don't we, to give the credit, to give the glory to the person? You know what the Lord makes it so clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7? For who makes you differ from another? Or what do you have that you did not receive? weren't literally gifted with by God. The point is, nothing. So he goes on and says, now if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Somehow, oh, it's me. You know? It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's the gift of God. Anything, any way, that's, that's from the Lord. You know, to, to give the glory to the person is like after a, a surgeon doing a, a successful operation and a wonderful job, the patient going into his office and saying, where's your bag? And runs over there and rummages through the surgeon's bag and finds the scalpel and said, oh, scalpel, you are awesome. What an uh, what a incredible job you did. I mean, you'd be crazy, wouldn't you? And yet that's what we do. Do you realize that? That's exactly what we do. What do you have at all that you didn't literally receive from God as a gift from God? And so, brethren, it's, it's as a Christian, when we feel like, recognize that Something good's happened here. We've been used by the Lord. There can be a tendency to think that, you know, take some credit, you know? 
Sort of like, um, I must be doing something right. God must have seen something in me. And the truth of the matter is, no, that's not it at all. God used you because he just chose to use you and was purely by his grace working according to his will. That's so clear through the word. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, when Israel had this momentous task of rebuilding the temple before them, God made it very plain. It is not going to be by might, nor is it going to be by power. You know what he's saying? It's not going to be by human ability at all. It's not going to be by human resources whatsoever, whatever they might be. But he goes, but by my spirit, says the Lord, this is going to work going to be a work of God. Paul understood that so clearly, you know. He says in 2 Corinthians, he said, when I came among you, I had some fear and trembling, and I didn't come with the persuasive words of men's wisdom, but just humbly and purely in demonstration of the Spirit of God and of power, the power of God. That your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, the rationale of men, but in the power of God. So, you know, there's a story about Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist of the 19th century, going with some of his friends into a restaurant downtown Chicago, and somebody happens to comment, Dr. Moody looked at a fellow that was literally drunk in the gutter and said, there's one of your converts right there. He had, he had evangelistic service in which thousands of people got saved. He was sort of the Billy Graham of his era. And Dr. Moody's comment was, that must be one of my converts because it's surely not one of the Lord's converts. You know, James tells us very pointedly in James 1.17, every, did you hear that word? Every good gift and per, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. I like what I heard Chuck Smith say a long time ago. He had a, after a, a sermon in Coast, Costa Mesa there at Calvary and he would recognize, boy, this was a winged dinger. This was an anointed one. This was really great. And he was feeling really good about it. His habit was to go to the rear of the, of the uh, auditorium and greet people as they go out. And so he's coming off the platform and he's walking down the aisle. And, oh, that was a good one. And the Lord, the Lord spoke to his heart that very word that I read a little bit earlier out of 1 Corinthians. What do you have that you did not receive? If anything good happened here, any good thing happened here, anything that could in any way be described as, boy, that was the Lord. And when the Lord does something, it's perfect. It's from Him. You know? So brethren, he says, he says there, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think soberly. Think soberly. That means use some sound judgment here. One person translated that to put a moderate estimate upon one's self. And then with that, he adds this going on. As God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. This plays into the way you think about yourself and the way you think soberly about yourself as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. In other words, let that estimation be based upon your faith in Jesus Christ. And that faith itself is from God to you. God's given to each one, dealt to each one a measure of faith. It's like he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, where he says, For you have been saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. So God has given that to us. The point is sound judgment. Listen. Sound judgment is not being impressed with yourself. And let me add to that, nor, and this is the more subtle form of it, cop that attitude, oh, I'm nothing. I'm no good. I'm of such little value. I'm just, I'm just a piece of dirt. That's all I am. That's a Poor me, isn't it? Poor me. That's very self-centered 
thinking. And it falls in the same category. That is not thinking of yourself soberly. And the point that he makes here, rather, we are to be impressed with the fact, listen, that Jesus Christ lives in this life, in this body. Jesus Christ dwells here. That this body, Christian, is residence of the Holy Spirit. I love the way Peter put it. Early on, Acts chapter 3, he and John are on their way to the temple. And there's this lame guy. He's been lame for 40 years there or so at the temple. He's a fixture at the temple, just a lame guy. And Peter goes up and says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And Peter grabs him and up he comes. And he's instantly healed and he begins jumping and dancing and praising the Lord. Of course, it causes a big scene at the temple. And most of the people recognize this guy. Isn't that that lame guy that's been there for 40 some years that can't walk, asking for alms and he's dancing around? Yeah, I'm him, I'm him. And so they're, you know, it's gathering a crowd. And I love what Peter says. Hey, don't think that this is some power that we have or some godliness that is in us. This has happened in the name of Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus, you were here. He got crucified, but he rose from the dead. And it's in his name. And it's by the power of his name. And it's faith in his name that has made this man well among you. It's not us. It's him. And the message of the apostles throughout the Roman world at that time was echoing that very same message. They were going everywhere and saying, don't look at us. We are just like you are. We are no different than you. And they're talking to pagan idol worshipers on the street. We're just like you. We're here to declare to you the name of Jesus Christ who can transform a life and change a life and redeem a life and give you the gift of eternal life because he purchased it for you. That was the message that went reverberating around the world at that time and has reverberated since then to this day. It's about him. So thinking soberly. You know what that is? That is genuine humbleness. Let me tell you about genuine humbleness. It is not self-depreciation. Self-degradation. No. It's a humility that recognizes it's not about me. It's about the Lord. This gives us some light in what James was saying when he admonishes us in James chapter 4, verse 6. You know, that's where he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You know, if God did everything you asked him to do, every time you asked him to do it exactly the way you wanted him to do it, and you were going around laying hands on people and they're all getting healed. Maybe you're moving a mountain. Oh, this mountain's in the way. Go over there, a mountain. You know, some raising people from the dead and everything. Can you imagine how that would go to your head? Can you imagine how puffed up you would probably become? I think right there's a reason God says, no, I'm not going to do that today. That's in his wisdom. But I can tell you this. God resists that attitude. Don't ever think it's you. Or don't ever think it's because of who you are. It's not. Doesn't that set you free? God can do through any of us whatever God wants to do through any of us. And so it's, it's like he says in verse 10 of James 4. Humble yourselves, and this is important, in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. When you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, you realize this is not about me. It's about Him, and the glory and the credit goes to Him. It's the Lord. And the Lord says, that's humbling yourself. Not depreciating yourself, humbling yourself. Because you are so valuable to the Lord. If he can use Balaam's donkey, he can use you. 
That encourages me. <laughs> He'll lift you up. You know what that means? That's when you're usable. And that's when he will use you for his glory the way he wants to use you. And so, brethren, you see, sober thinking about yourself, renewed mind about yourself, it's not about me. I'm not the center of this thing. It's about him. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who it's about. That's what it's about. And that leads to a renewed mind about your fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord in particular. Once you've, you've sort of, you know, embraced that renewed thinking about yourself, the beauty of that, it gives you a sober thinking, you know, some, some sound judgment about your brothers and sisters, every single one of them, whomever they might be. And it's, it's from that that he says this in verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, talking about our human body, but all the members, the parts of our body, do not have the same function. You know, we're, we're a masterly created human body that, that, we, that we live in, you know? And it's, it's, it's incredible. It's amazing. And it's got multitudes, you know, of different parts that look different and that function differently and in and, and different ways and at different times and everything. I mean, it is just amazing. And he says, that's what your human body is like. Think about that for a minute. He goes on in verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. It's one body, the body of Christ, all of us, but how different we are. Just think of this now. One body, spiritually, one body. He's talking about a definite spiritual unity here. You know why there's such an incredible, amazing unity here? Because the Jesus Christ that lives in your heart, believer, is the Jesus Christ that lives in my heart. The Holy Spirit that indwells you is the Holy Spirit that indwells me. It's the same person. And that makes us one in a very, very significant, powerful, deep, and listen, eternal way. That's the, that's the tightest, most significant human bond there is in life, even over blood. Because this one is eternal, and it makes us part of Christ himself. That's big, that's powerful. And we're one together in this thing. And we're all apart. You know what? Uh, reminds me when uh, I was in Israel a while back, we came to Phil uh, Caesarea Philippi. And that, which is the headwaters of the Jordan River, we had a little Bible study there. And I had a little group around us, you know, that was on the tour with us. And, and I was sharing out of the Word. And this little family uh, was walking by. They were Palestinians. And they saw me kind of teaching the Word, and the people gathered around. And they got all excited. And they came over, and they interrupted me right in the middle of my Bible study. They walked right up to me and said, Hi, we're Christians too. We're Palestinians. And that was one time I didn't mind the interruption at all. That was so special. It was like the Lord, through those Palestinians, intervened in the middle of that little Bible study, and we had a few minutes where we had the most intimate, warm fellowship and expression of just love and oneness with our group and with this little Palestinian family, a husband and wife and a couple of kids, and we're all rejoicing in the Lord together. And they live in the West Bank, they live in Palestine, and they love Jesus. And in a few minutes later, gotta go, nice to meet you, we love you, off they went. And there was a bond there, that's what we're talking about. You know, Jesus prayed for us that we would recognize the depth and the wonder of that bond. In his high priestly prayer for the body of Christ, he said in John 17, 20 and 21, I, I do not pray for these alone, the disciples that were with him, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. Oh, there's a powerful witness to the world in that spiritual unity that we all are blessed to have. And so, brethren, God, we're equally loved. We are 
equally valued by Him. We are equally valuable to Him. Every one of us. And we're singularly a part of that body. And that's the point he's driving at, actually, in this passage. We're one, but you know what? We are each a different part. So that's his point. You know, verse 4, as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so also is the body of Christ. There's amazing diversity here. And there's all this, this dynamic difference in us, but each one is vitally important. I like the way he puts it in 1 Corinthians when he talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, verse 14 to 18, for in fact the body is not one member, one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I am not part, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Well, you can see that one. Yeah, there's the foot saying, look, the hand gets all the credit. The hand gets all the action. The hand's out there, you know, tugging people and touching people and working. I have to sit in a smelly old shoe all day, you know, and I get sore. And, and yet, you know, what, what, what is the head trying to do? The head is usually trying to hide me while the hand is out there. How can, I'm really of no value here. And the head is going, foot, I need you to be a foot. You don't know how valuable you are to me as a foot. Please, would you just be my foot? I need you to be my foot. That's the spirit of what he's saying here. He goes on there in, first, in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. If, and, and if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? He goes on, if the whole body were an eye. Can you imagine that? That would be a horror movie. The eye. Pussy old eye. Oh. The whole body were an eye. Where were the hearing be? Where would, or, and, and if the whole body were hearing, where would the smelling be? But here's the point. But now God has set the members, each part, each one of them in the body just as it pleased him. Each one has a special place, has a special function designed by God for his purpose just the way God made that brother and that sister. That's the point. You know, there was a, in a newsletter, it was actually a public school newsletter in Springfield, Oregon, that, that made a point similar to this. I want to read part of it to you. Once upon a time, they used sort of an allegory. The animals decided they should do something meaning, meaningful to meet the problems of the new world, so they organized a school, and they adopted an activity curriculum of running, climbing, swimming, and flying. To make it easier to administer the curriculum, all the animals took all the subjects. The duck was an excellent in swimming. In fact, he was better than his instructor but he made only passing grades at flying and was very poor in running. Since he was slow in running, he had to drop swimming and stay after school to practice running. That caused his webbed feet to be badly worn so that he became only average in swimming. But average was quite acceptable and nobody worried about that except the duck. The rabbit started at the top of his class in running but he developed a nervous twitch in his leg muscles because of so much makeup work in swimming. The squirrel was excellent in climbing, but encountered constant friction in flying class because his teacher made him start from the ground up instead of from the treetop down. He developed Charlie horses over, oh, from overexertion and, and so got only a C in climbing and a D in running. The eagle was the problem, child. He was severely disciplined for being a nonconformist. In climbing classes, he beat all the others to the top of the tree, but he insisted on using his own way to get there. But you see the point. You know, we've all been so wonderfully gifted by the Lord, spiritually gifted by the Lord, but our capabilities are limited. And God designed it that way that we would have a mutual caring and a sharing and an appreciation for each other in the body of Christ. And the glory would be, glory would be to Him. 
So brethren, what is renewed thinking about? Renewed thinking about our fellow believers? It's an appreciation of the unique and individual potential of each one of us. Not exalting one and not demeaning others. But recognizing we are mutually, really, dependent on each other in this good work. And we're in this together. And somebody that we see that, I really don't know what they're doing here. God may have a work he's doing in and through them, for them, that is going to be not only a blessing to that body, but a blessing to the body of Christ in years to come. So Paul is encouraging along that line, don't fall into the trap of expecting others to have the same burden and the same vision for everything that you may have. You know? Kind of reminds me of uh, years ago, I was just in Cleveland for a, a conference, you know, kind of a, a three-day conference in Cleveland, and it was at a hotel downtown Cleveland. And there was one time, you know, with me and a, some pastors had gone and got something to eat, and we're on our way back to the hotel. And at downtown Cleveland, man, you know, downtown city, people walking here and there. The sidewalks are full of people, you know, just going here and there like a New York City type thing. And I'm walking along, and here's this guy standing on a street corner. He's got his Bible open, and he's preaching up a storm. No one is listening. But he is preaching away, you know, like to the wind. People are just going past. They're just ignoring him. But he's there and just preaching away. And my heart went out to that guy. And I just wanted to encourage him in that. I thought, praise the Lord. Look what that guy's doing out here. So I walked up to him just to say, hey, praise the Lord in what you're doing here. And the guy, he was a big guy, so he kind of looked down at me. And he had daggers in his eyes. And he said, Whoa, yeah? Well, then why aren't you here doing this? I'm going, whoa. Don't fall yourself into a trap of condemning others because they're, they're not doing what you think they ought to be doing. God's got a plan. And it's a unique plan for each one of us. And his plan and his purpose is it's going to be different. And that's something that God orchestrates. And Paul is bringing that home. So how do we feel about our fellow man? Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful variety and potential we have here as we share our faith in Jesus Christ together, which is our bond. That's the spirit of it. And then that leads to that, that attitude about what am I really here for? You know, what's, what's our purpose for being here? I think a lot of people, even Christians, get the feeling we live in America. Our purpose here is to experience the American dream. You know, get as much as we can, make as much as we can, have a nice cozy retirement, you know, uh, uh, be able to do things that we want to do, you know, or just, you know, things like that. And there's a real focus in that area. But I want to point out to you that God didn't call us to the American dream. And in answer to that, I want you to notice what he says here. Going on, he says in verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Brethren, here's the point. We're, si we're here simply to be instruments in God's hand and to be guided and empowered by His Spirit according to His will and His plan. What He wants to do with us. I want you to notice in what he says here three things. Number one is this. Each has at least one spiritual gift. Every single Christian has been given a gift or gifts of the Holy Spirit minus none. Maybe your gifting isn't one specifically listed here, but it probably falls into one of these categories. 
I want to point out to you, every time the Bible talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it does not give an exhaustive list. It said these are examples of gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's important. But they are of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? We're not talking about simply natural abilities. We all have natural abilities. We've been given natural abilities. No, he's talking about something a little different here. It's a supernatural enabling of the Holy Spirit in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, natural ability may come into play. God may put an anointing on that in his spirit and that that natural ability becomes being used as a spiritual gift. But you know what? It may have no connection at all to any natural ability that you have. It may be just a gift of the Holy Spirit God has given to you. Every single one of you have been blessed with by by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, a gift or gifts of the Holy Spirit that God has given to you for a specific reason, to use for God's glory. The second thing is this. Here's his point. Use it. That's the point. You know? Notice what he says. Verse 6, they're about midway through. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Prophecy isn't just foretelling the future. Prophecy is clearly in Scripture a foretelling of the truths of God. That's included in prophecy. And, and he says, you feel like God's giving you something that's from the Lord? Share it! That's according to the proportion of faith. I think that's from the Lord. Share it! You know? Use it! That's the idea. He goes on there. <clears throat> if... Um, or ministry, verse 7. Let us use it in our ministering. The word there simply means just serving in every practical, regular ways, you know? I mean, uh, setting up and, and cleaning and extending a helpful hand to help somebody with something, you know? Those kinds of things, that's ministering. However that might come, there's a, there's a wide variety of ways that can happen in a person's life. But the point about it is, and here's the point he's making, when the Lord's involved in that, that is a spiritual ministry, It's not just something you're doing physically. There's spiritual reality and spiritual power behind it. So he says, do it. Do it. See what God might want to do there. You may not see what God wants to do there until you get to glory and go, oh, God did that there? That's why Jesus said you can't hand a glass of cold water to somebody who's thirsty without receiving an eternal reward for that, Christian. You don't know how God's going to use that. So you got an opportunity for ministering, minister. And he goes on. In our, in our te- he who teaches, in teaching. He who exhorts, in exhortation. Just think, gift of the Holy Spirit, exhorting. That's the same word in the Greek that's in verse 1 where Paul says, I beseech you, brethren. It's urging somebody, urging them to trust in the Lord. You get up there, just trust the Lord here. Yeah, but I don't know. Trust the Lord. Walk with Him. Gift of the Spirit. Wow. Holy Spirit power. Wow. He who gives. Spiritual gift. Giving with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Showing mercy, that's a heart for the down and the outer. That's a heart for the the fallen or or the backslidden or the hurting. My heart goes out to him. I want to reach out to him. Do it. That's a spiritual gift and a working of the Spirit. The whole point is all these are gifts of the Holy Spirit, Christian. And I would say this, man, if you have a heart for it and there's a, a clear sense of joy and fulfillment in doing it, and especially you see some fruit there, the point is, go for it. Go for it. Go for it there. Don't hold back. And don't be like that duck who is all bummed out because he can't run like a rabbit. (laughs) Swim like a duck. That's the idea. And so use it. Use it. What God's given you. 
the way God's designed you, where God's put you. Here I am, Lord. It's Romans chapter 1. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God. Present your body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, and see what God wants to do with it. You'll discover that his will is good and acceptable and perfect. And then thirdly, I want to point out that there is an infinite variety of gifts in the way they operate. Infinite variety. Every time gifts are listed, it's not an exhaustive list. It's just example gifts. You know, some people, they can really get into discovering their spiritual gift. And you know what? I'm not against that. I think that can be helpful. I think it can be interesting and kind of encouraging to do that. But I would say this. Be careful about that. For this reason, for one thing, you can sort of begin getting an ab- attitude that how can I really effectively serve the Lord if I don't know what my spiritual gift is? I need to know what my spiritual gift is so I can really effectively serve the Lord. You can effectively serve Him without knowing. God knows what it is. He can use it without ever telling you. So, and then there's another thing. You know, it, it could cause it actually a limiting of the way the Holy Spirit wants to use you. In other words, you can sort of get this feeling like, well, I can't do that because it's not my gift. Wait a minute. In any situation, any time, God may choose and ordain to anoint and use you in a certain way, manifesting a particular gift at that time and that place on that occasion for God's glory. And he says, I want to use you. I do not have the gift of healing. But you know what? I prayed for a lot of people to be healed, and I've actually had the joy and privilege of laying hands on somebody, praying for them, and seeing them gloriously and miraculously healed by the hand of God. So it's not a matter of, well, that's not my gift, so I can't do that. You see? There's such a variety, and God wants to use us in so many ways. You know, what I find interesting is you look through, you know, the believers in the Bible, there's not a big emphasis on what their spiritual gifts were. You don't even know what the, the gifts of the apostles were necessarily. He never promises the gifts are going to come neatly packaged and labeled for you. You know the way I see it? I see it, it's sort of like an artist mixing colors together on a palette to get just the hue, just the shade he wants for his masterpiece. And here's God. He sees the whole picture. And guess what? You've been called out of this world to be a part of that. An integral little part of that. And he sort of mixes and works to get just each part to be exactly what he wants to do with that part for his glory. And every single one of us have a part and parcel and a piece in his masterpiece of the ages. And that's what God is doing in our generation on this planet through his body, the living church. So brethren, It's not about identifying and labeling as much as it is simply about being surrendered and used by God by the power of His Holy Spirit according to His plan. And when we recognize an opportunity, go ahead, go for it. And brethren, the spiritual gifts are the gifts will we'll become evident. I think we really discover that realm as we just, as you said in verse 1, present that body to him and say, however you want to use this, Lord, here I am. And so uh, there's a lot of brethren out there that I think are probably operating powerfully in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and don't even know it. So, you see? You know how this little section began? Verse 1 and 2. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to the world, 
Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And it's like the Lord saying at that point, thus saith the Lord, you'll see, you'll see. And really, really, that's what we're here for. Jesus said, that's life. And that's life more abundantly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your great love with which you love each one of us. Thank you for the awesome salvation that we enjoy in and through Jesus in our relationship with Jesus. Thank you for the gifting of the Holy Spirit to help us on this pilgrim's path and to even use us for your glory. Thank you. And we, we sit here on this Sunday morning and say, let it be. Let it be, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.